Today's date is May 22nd, 2017. From this website, jewishvirtuallibrary.org, this article is entitled The Jewish Temples After the Babylonian Exile from 538 to 332 BCE. I'll read bits and pieces of it. First part under the heading Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. When Cyrus the Persian conquered Mesopotamia and the whole of the Middle East, he did so for religious reasons. Unlike any conqueror before him, Cyrus set out to conquer the entire world. Before Cyrus and the Persians, conquest was largely a strategic affair. You guaranteed your territorial safety by conquering potential enemies. But Cyrus wanted the whole world, and he wanted it for religious reasons, so he's doing it differently, based on the reason behind it. Barely a century before, the Persians were a ragtag group of tribes living north of Mesopotamia. They were Indo-European. They spoke a language from the Indo-European family, which includes Greek, German, and English. To the Mesopotamians, they were little better than animals, and so they went largely ignored. They were largely ignored. But in the middle of the 7th century BC, a prophet, Zarathustra, appeared among them and preached a new religion. This religion would become Zoroastrianism. In Greek, Zarathustra is called Zoroaster. The Zoroastrians believed that the universe was dualistic and it was made up of two distinct parts. One was good and light and the other evil and dark. Let's jump down some more. Although Zoroastrianism involved two gods, one good and one evil, all other gods were ranged on one side or the other of this equation. Cyrus believed Yahweh was one of the good gods, and he claimed that Yahweh visited him one night. In that vision, Yahweh commanded him to re-establish Yahweh worship in Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. Cyrus ordered the temple rebuilt, but what good is a temple without worshippers? To this end, he ordered that the Hebrews in Babylon return to Jerusalem. In fact, Cyrus sent many people back to the native lands in order to worship the local gods there. So he would do this with different kinds of people, so this wasn't anything out of character, I guess, for him. So the situation with the Hebrews was not unique. Not all of the Hebrews went home. A large portion stayed in Babylon, and some had converted to Babylonian religions. The rebuilding of the temple. The salient feature to keep in mind, however, is that Cyrus sent the Hebrews home for religious purposes only. Judah was re-established only so Yahweh could be worshipped, and the Hebrews were sent to Judah for the express purpose of worshipping Yahweh. Now it's going to get interesting. I'm going to read about two and a half paragraphs here from this page and show you again from history that this Jesus or Hebrew Mashiach has nothing to do with the Creator and that the Hebrews did not accept him while he was through his disciples building his new Christian religion. The Hebrews did not accept him and so they were slaughtered by the Romans and the rest who were able to escape, escaped and ran into parts of Africa and other places. This Hebrew Mashiach has nothing to do with the Hebrews who received their, a lot of their teachings from Moses coming on down. So it says here, before the exile, Judah and Israel were merely kingdoms. Now Judah was now going to become a theological state returning from Babylon. The shining symbol of this new state dedicated to Yahweh was the Temple of Solomon, which had been burned to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. Under the direction of Zerubbabel and later Ezra, the temple is rebuilt and the walls of the city rebuilt by Nehemiah. 
The rebuilding of the temple was difficult. Very few Hebrews actually returned home, so the effort was monumental. I guess it would have been easier if more of them had returned than they could have helped some more. During the exile, the Hebrews set about purifying their religion. Ah, oh, I see, this is funny. I didn't expect this connection because the reason why I started this was because, as I mentioned, I was looking up the Masoretes. And what I'm going to show in another recording is that the Masoretes were changing the text or putting in their vowel pointings and, and whatever else they were doing because they were trying to purify the text from the corruption that happened in Babylon. But here we find that the Hebrews had already set about purifying their own religion. And you can't purify your religion, quote-unquote religion, if you're not purifying the text that gives it life. So what were the Masoretes doing in like 8, 9, 10 hundred AD? What were they purifying? Anyway, so, so I mean, that just makes you think, what was the real reason why the Masoretes were doing stuff to the text about a thousand years ago? Anyway, during the exile, the Hebrews set about purifying their religion. They attempted to return to their laws and cultic practices according to the Mosaic originals. So they're going back to what it was like with Moses. This newfound concern with cultic purity and the Mosaic laws, combined with the re-establishment of Judah as a theological state, produced a different society. People, listen to me. So many people are getting concerned more and more about this messianic and non-messianic view. The Old Testament or Torah only believers and those who believe in Torah plus the New Testament. I have made it clear so many times throughout my lessons that the Hebrews did not want this messianic thing from this 2,000 year old Jesus that walked in the Roman Empire when the Romans ruled over our people. I have shown that. And here again it's coming out. Even the Jewish Virtual Library org website is telling you that the Hebrews, and you'll find this a lot of other books and websites as well, were so concerned with returning to the purity of their Mosaic laws that they use this word cultic to describe the kind of feverish frenzy and attitude and concern that they had in doing this. You cannot use words like cultic to describe how they were returning to the Mosaic instructions and think that that included a Jesus which they were going to be accepting and looking forward to. They were not looking forward to a Messiah that came from Judah in 0 AD or thereabouts. No writing anywhere in the Old Testament is the picture I'm more getting now allowed them to properly be looking forward to a Messiah who is going to be born in the house of Mary and Joseph. None. Nothing in the Old Testament points to that. None. And so people are getting concerned. They're starting to, they're getting agitated more and more. Cursing out the ones who are saying there is nothing like this yet. Like, like saying that there is no such truth in this Messiah from 0 AD. Because we are striking it down. One by one, we are doing that. Because when you look at it now, the history is saying that they were going for cultic purity. In other words, nothing else is getting through the door that was not already coming through the door in the time of Moses. So it doesn't matter what kind of prophecy you think you should be following. If it was not practiced at the time of Moses to lift hands to a Jesus and to worship a Jesus, he says no. The history is saying no. That the Hebrews were not dealing with it. They were returning to that which was. They were returning to what they were taught through Moses by the Most High. And no one was worshipping or believing in a Jesus. But you say that because it is prophecy, it had to 
come later on because that's what prophecy is dealing with. But prophecy does not only deal with what's going to come in the future. A prophetic word that's telling you something about the future gives you stability today. So that a word of anything prophetic from Moses or from any of the other prophets about a Jesus who should have come should have let them have the faith and trust in that prophet right then. So that if I were there at the time when Moses was saying this or that or any other prophet, I would then want to find out from that prophet if this so-called Messiah is going to come, let's say in 0 AD, in the Roman Empire, how do we go about preparing for him right now? And how do we express some kind of worship for him right now? Why would the expression be important to show that the prophecies of this Mashiach was really from the Most High or that those prophecies are being correctly understood? Why? Because Jesus was not like someone else who was prophesied to come later on, who never lived. The Messianic believers clearly teach that Jesus, by his Hebrew name or by no name, simply as an angel had already appeared multiple times in the Old Testament and had physical or verbal interaction slash communication with Shemites. If he already made such very clear appearances and interactions, even walking them out of Egypt, even with the Most High saying, my angel, he's not on a play with you, don't mess with him, right? That means he would kill you. So he would have physical contact with you or appearance with you to kill you. In other words, he was that close to them. He was that real. You said Jesus showed up with the three Hebrew boys, with Daniel, with Abraham. Knowing that the Hebrews had all this wealth of knowledge of the Hebrew Mashiach showing up even in pre-Moses times and even in Babylon with Daniel and so on. It would have been irresponsible of the Hebrews to hear Moses or other prophets talking about this Mashiach who should come and know that he already appeared multiple times throughout Old Testament times when they were living and before they were living, and not have some kind of way to express worship and adoration of him. Impossible. Because why is it that gods they were instructed to not worship? They went ahead and worshipped them, but their own Savior came in pre-New Testament times and appeared to Abraham, to three Hebrew boys, to down in the lines there, or whatever, um, and whoever else he might have appeared to, as Jesus, or by Hebrew name, or just as a Melech, why is it that their own Elohim, or son of their own Elohim, which is Elohim himself, they say, showed up in the Old Testament, but they refused to worship him and adore him and spread knowledge of him all over Israel and Judah. But they so quickly took on foreign gods and spread the knowledge of them all throughout Israel and Judah, the kingdoms, and even built shrines unto them, built gardens unto them, built altars unto them. So your own God shows up at times to Hebrews when Hebrews had not yet fallen away. Or in times, I'm talking about the, the, the main falling away that, that took down Israel at the end. And they don't care about worshipping him like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're waiting for him to come. We're waiting for him to come. Yeah, he's going to come and born to Mary and Joseph. We're waiting for him to come. We're... But he shows up in these other kinds of ways and appears to these different people in the Old Testament. And that does not carry any weight. If I was looking forward to him to come and I was living way back then and I heard that he showed up to Noah, uh, I mean to Abraham, and they're making him food and so on, and he showed up to whoever else. You're not going to keep my mouth shut. All, that, all that's in the mind of the Hebrew and all that would have been in my mind is that, oh, he showed up early. Oh, he's touching down. Oh, okay, he's not staying. Okay, I, I, okay. well, I still want to see him. I still want to tell me what he said. Teach me this. Teach me that. He shows up to Abraham and they're trying to say, hey, stay with us. Let's make you food and so on. 
and no great teachings come from him. Well, what did he show up to Abraham for? No, none of the times when this Hebrew Mashiach showed up in the Old Testament did he drop any massive amount of teachings, like different prophets dropped their teachings and you have books written about these prophets and kings. Like you got the book of Amos and so on, whatever, right? Or any book. But the son of the living God, the actual savior, shows up multiple times in the Old Testament and there's not a book written about him and his teachings. He seemed to have a lot to say to the people whenever he showed up, but there's no teachings from him that was written in a book. This is Jesus from the Old Testament. So that when he shows up in the New Testament, Hebrews would have no trouble believing him. Yeah, because we got his book right here. It is the book of Jesus. Or it is the book of Yahawashai. Yahawashai chapter 1, in the time of Abraham. And he appeared unto Abraham and he said such and such unto Abraham. And Abraham said this back to him and so on and so forth. So, it's saying here that they had a cultic desire and effort to return to the Mosaic laws. Which means anything that was not according to the teachings of Moses that they were actually physically doing and participating in, they weren't going to be dealing with it. That's what it means when it says cultic practices and purity of the Mosaic laws. That means that something new like this Jesus coming in in the New Testament times, they weren't going to be having it. So it goes on here. Cultic purity of the Mosaic laws combined with the re-establishment of Judah as a theological state produced a different society. Different from how it was broken down because they left off their laws and that's why they ended up into captivity. Hebrew society was almost solely concerned with religious matters in the Persian period. Let me read that part again. Hebrew society was almost solely are only concerned with religious matters in the Persian period. So if they were mainly concerned with religious matters in the times of the Persians, that means the kind of teachings they would have been adhering to would have been teachings according to Mosaic instruction. And no one can read to me where, where Moses taught Hebrews in his day to lift hands to a Jesus. So that means that the cultic purity that they returned to was teachings that included dealing with the Most High alone and not teachings that taught any Hebrew to lift hands to or believe or express faith or worship to a Jesus that never appeared in the time of Moses, in Moses' teachings. Because Moses' teachings excluded actions that had to do with worshipping Jesus. So if you're keeping your, your prophecies that you think prophesied about Jesus, that's just you simply keeping that. But what the Hebrews did was something real. The Hebrews always did something real. And their prophecies had to do with the real thing that they were doing. With a prophecy that actually was going to do something about the real thing that they were involved in. And the real thing they were involved in was performing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis, things specified in the Mosaic laws that they were supposed to carry out. None of those instructions included carrying out on an annual basis or monthly or so any kind of instruction to do something about Jesus or Yeshua worship. None. So when they were returning with cultic purity to the Mosaic laws, it did not include anything about a Hebrew Messiah. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Hebrew Messiah was, was concerned with religious matters in the Persian period. Foreign religions were not tolerated as they had been before because different religions was what got them into captivity in the first place. So now, if you look at how the Hebrews were functioning with cultic purity in the Mos according to Mosaic laws, doing anything different would then be doing things according to religions of the foreign um, teachings of foreign religions. 
That means if foreign religions were not tolerated, that means something different that did not resemble Mosaic laws were not tolerated. Teachings that were not according to Mosaic laws were not tolerated. So now, the Jesus of the Roman Empire, even if you want to call him a Hebrew Mashiach, could not have been um, tolerated because it was foreign to the Mosaic laws and the cultic purity that they had decided in their heart to return unto. And even in Acts chapter 2, as I've been dealing with lately, when it says devout men came from the different nations under heaven and came to Jerusalem, it shows that they were returning to their cultic purity following the Mosaic laws. Instead of saying, no, I'm not going to go to Jerusalem because we're worshipping this other God here and we, we, our kingdom got broken up anyway. No, it shows that they had returned. And so they were in coming to Jerusalem for Jesus and for the Holy Ghost baptism on the day of Pentecost. They were coming there because they had returned to the purity of their Mosaic laws and the Romans tortured them and killed them because they did not want to change. During the Persian period and later, Judah was the state where Yahweh and only Yahweh was worshipped. Both the Persians and the Greeks respected this exclusivity. Read that part again. Both the Persians and the Greeks respected this exclusivity. In other words, the Persians and the Greeks decided to show some respect for the Hebrews not wanting to worship anything else, any other god, take on any other deity and go about doing practices that had newness to them that were new in comparison to the practices that they did in the Mosaic laws. So a practice like a crucifixion on a cross and a practice like speaking in tongues where every one of us is speaking a different tongue and so on, they would not have had anything to do with that. Even the Persians and the Greeks have left their own records letting us know that they respected the exclusivity of the way that the Hebrews functioned in their times. They would not have anything to do with such practices. They were different. Everybody getting up and speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, that was different to the Mosaic law instructions. So the Hebrews were not going to be a part of that. The Persians and the Greeks are actually letting you know that. The Hebrews participating in receiving something from a Calvary crucifixion was not something that the Hebrews, that the Persians and the Greeks are going to tell you that the, the, the Hebrews were into. They weren't into that kind of stuff because it was not according to the purity of the Mosaic laws. So both the Persians and the Greeks respected this exclusivity of the Hebrews to worship only their Yahweh. But the Romans would greatly offend the Jews or the Hebrews when they introduced foreign gods. So get that. The Persians and the Greeks, they respected the exclusive religion of the Hebrews to worship Yahweh. But the Romans came along and said... Uh-uh, we don't do it like that. We don't care. We're going to introduce all these foreign gods and so on. And we're going to be big on the history of Jesus. And everyone who reads the New Testament knows that no matter what kind of prophecy you feel in the Old Testament talks about Jesus or Yahushua, everyone who reads the New Testament knows that Jesus or Yahushua is very deeply connected to and intertwined with the Romans or the Roman Empire. So if the Romans had so many foreign gods that they introduced and allowed hundreds of gods to be worshipped in their empire and a Jesus shows up who was not worshipped in Mosaic times, doesn't that sound to you like the Romans are introducing this Jesus or Yahushua or Yeshua kind of teaching and story? It tells you that the Persians and the Greeks left the Hebrews alone to worship the way they wanted to worship. But then, all of a sudden, the Romans, who didn't give a damn about that, when they came in, a Jesus appears. It clearly then means that the Romans had no respect for the exclusivity of the Hebrews worshipping their God and introduced another God. 
And so many people and books and history has shown that the Romans were dealing with these demigods. The Hebrews had learned many things from the Persians and actively included Persian elements in their religion. It's important to note that this occurred side by side with the effort to purify the religion, which would then be the reason why they are purifying it. If it's side by side, obviously that makes sense because the purifying is going to be side by side because it's like if you're cleaning out your car, it's happening. that cleaning is happening side by side with the car being messy. Because the car is messy, you are cleaning it. But it is also true that while it is being cleaned, it is still messy. It still looks messy. But you are cleaning it up. So they are doing this side by side, uh, purifying the religion while it was messy with Persian elements. That's the reason why they were purifying it, people, because they were trying to get back to the mosaic instructions. Most of these elements were popular elements rather than official beliefs. They would persist only in Christianity which arose among the people rather than the educated and priestly classes. Um, okay, I'll stop there. But So basically, if these different beliefs that they had existed only in Christian, would persist only in Christianity, is telling you that the Hebrews who were not Christians were not a part of this, but the other group of the Christians had those other beliefs. And the reason why it persisted in Christianity was because the Hebrews did not participate in the Roman religion of Christianity with its Christ. I still am waiting for people to show the overwhelming move of Jesus with the Israelites who ran from Jerusalem in AD 70 into Africa and other parts of, of, of the areas around Jerusalem. Where is the overwhelming thrust of this Yahweh or Yahushua movement? If they fled from Roman persecution, why didn't they flee with their Jesus or their Yahushua, their Hebrew Mashiach, and have their Hebrew Mashiach kicking up dust everywhere they went and turning people back to the law and so on, whatever, since they're going to teach this Yahushua Messiah right, right. Then that would mean that the Christians that are left do not have the power of God because he was not sent unto them. And if a house divided cannot stand, like the same Jesus said, how is it that if Jesus came just to the Hebrews but the, the Christians which are the Celts and the Greeks and the Romans and everybody else who was in the empire as Gentiles, they took on the belief of Jesus. So now you got two groups of people believing it. You got the Hebrews and the Gentiles in the Roman Empire in Jerusalem believing in the teachings of Jesus. House divided cannot stand. So now you got one house of Jesus. Everybody's now believing on the Son of God. The house splits where the Hebrews were being slaughtered, so they fled and ran out of the Holy Land, ran into Africa, and the other part of the house, calling themselves Christians, stay. But they are one house of Jesus. How is it that it can be true that a house divided against itself cannot stand? Not that it may not, but cannot stand. When the house of Jesus or the house of the Messiah split when some who were the Hebrews fled away in AD 70 and the rest who were the Gentiles stayed in the Roman Empire areas, in Jerusalem and the other areas. And 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 the the house still stood. He said the house of Adi cannot stand. If the house of Jesus stood, something is wrong. The, the teachings of Jesus there are incorrect, it's wrong. When he said the house divided cannot stand. Because if the same Messiah is from both sides, grouping both sides together in a house, a house of Jesus belief or a house of Messiah belief, then if one group the Hebrews are running, then the other group should not have any success because it fell down, because the house is now divided, so it is impossible for the house to stand. And it just reminds me of when the kingdom split 
into the north and south and then they really went down because it's really true according to the Hebrews life that when Israel and Judah became their own separate kingdoms they fell down and got worse and worse until they ended up into the last set of captivities but this house of Jesus belief of Messiah belief did not stand except that the truth is it did not stand for the Hebrews who fled but it stood for the Christians so Jesus or the Messiah's own words failed to stand up at that point because Christianity with its Messiah belief did stand but it said that the house will not stand and how do we know that Jesus belief stood for the Christians because they grew to over 2 billion people on the earth still propagating the Jesus Calvary Messiah message why is it that the Hebrews did not run into Africa and push with the power of the Spirit a Messiah message that just became a massive mighty religion ain't nobody out there trying to claim some Hebrew religion that's of the size and magnitude of the Christian religion on the earth today nobody so why is it that your Messiah works for Gentiles to build their Gentile Empire religion Christianity but it didn't work for the Hebrews who fled and it's the same Jesus who's lording over the same one house which he said if it's divided it should not stand and there was two groups in there the Hebrews and the Gentiles the house was divided the Hebrews ran but the house still stood for the Gentiles and the Gentiles got the benefit of the power of God that came to the Hebrews as you teach because you say the world in the New Testament is the world of the Hebrews yet somebody hijacked your entire world and built a mighty religious empire out of it think people I find in closing that most of these Hebrews who are complaining about the non-messianics they are believing as I've said before in other recordings but they are not reasoning the whole thing through properly they are afraid of the Jesus teachings going down which is what's happening they are giving too much attention and focus to belief but not thinking through properly too much belief very little proper reasoning because you can quote this verse and that verse and this prophecy and show that this is the understanding that of how it was fulfilled in the New Testament does not mean that you are thinking through properly you are simply believing because as I've shown here history shows that any time certainly at this time and certainly it's seen throughout the other times in scriptures when the Hebrews took on any God that was not according to Mosaic instruction such as again in the book of Judges anytime they took on any kind of activity or spiritual teachings that led them into belief and practices that was not according to what they taught with their mouth in the time of Moses they entered into captivity and into a time where purity was lost